Hello and welcome to Getting APIs to Work. In this video, we'll talk about the difference between private APIs, partner APIs, and public APIs, and how that affects how you design APIs. In my recent video on GraphQL, I mentioned that GraphQL is probably a good choice for more private APIs and that REST often is a better choice for public APIs and partner APIs. And then I got a lot of questions asking, what are these different groups of APIs even about? So I want to expand on that a little bit, talk about these different kinds of APIs, private, partner, public, and talk about how it, um, how this differentiation affects the design of an API. And it's also something where when we talked about system APIs, you re remember that video where I was saying that system APIs can be a good idea, but they still need to be designed. And that's exactly what we're talking about here. So the system API often is private. It's a relatively low level. It provides access to some relatively low level capabilities, but it's still an API. But it has different design constraints than partner and public APIs. So let's look at what that actually means. So when you look at the distinction between private, partner, and public, that means that your private ones are used by consumers within your organization. The partner ones are used by consumers that have a well-established relationship with your organization. So often there's kind of a partner program, there's some kind of approval process, there's some kind of contractual relationship also. So that's a different scope. And then you look at public APIs and these often are very open. You still may have to sign up, but you really have no idea who's using them and you want as many people as possible to use them because that may be the goal of those APIs to be as open and as widely used as possible. So you want to design them in a way that it's easy to understand them, easy to use them so that you get many users, but you have a different relationship with those users. Now let's look at four important design constraints that you have to keep an eye on when you design these different types of APIs. And again, it's really just all about design. There's other aspects as well, such as operational ideas around how to implement those APIs, how to manage them, how to expose them. But these are not the things we will look at today. Today, we just look at design. And what we really do is we look at how design, how do I design a product? Again, each API is a product so that it's well designed for the intended consumers. And coming back to the video on API products, when you think about that, what I said was an API is like beer. So if you design something, for example, to be eye-catching, then it's something that you design differently because you want certain things to happen, you want people to to notice your product and so forth. And it's a different kind of design as if you would design, going back to the beer, if you would design beer just for internal consumption, right? If you would just hand out beer in the brewery, you would just hand it out in, in a glass or in a very plain bottle because you don't need the same kind of design that goes into this. So let's look at the different design constraints that we have to be aware of. The first one is the domain knowledge. So when you look at what you can count on, then for private APIs, it's very clear that users of the private API, they are within your organization, so they know much more about what your organization is doing, what the whole context is of data and services that you provide. So you can, you can count on that. That's something that you can easily take as one aspect of design. If you look at partner APIs, it's already a little bit different. You may, you, very likely, you do not want to expose the whole complexity of what all of your APIs are doing, but you may have a portfolio of partner APIs. So that's kind of the relationship of uh, the, the domain that you can count on. And the last one are public APIs. So when you look at public APIs, you really don't want to count on any domain knowledge because you want 
people who want to use your API. You want them to very easily understand what your API does without having to learn a lot of related concepts. So the domain that you would then be able to count on should be as small as you can possibly make it so that it's easy to understand. Okay, that was the first one. Let's go to the second one. The second one is the relationship with the consumer. So when you look at private APIs, it's something where the consumers and the producers are in the same organization. So you can manage things much more easily, such as when you want to, for example, change the API or you want to decommission the API. These are things you can do much more easily because there is a coordinated management of consumers and producers. When you look at partner APIs, it's already, already a little bit different. You probably have some kind of relationship. So there's maybe a contractual framework or some other partner program that you have. So you still have some ways of coordinating with API consumers, but you already probably need to make things a little bit more well controlled so that consumers don't get any nasty surprises. When you look at public APIs, it may be something where you have rather little information about consumers. You probably have some kind of sign-up information, but you can't really count on these things to be very reliable or to be very effective. So for example, when you want to announce some changes to the API, it may be really hard to reach all consumers of the API. And you have to take that into account so that the consumers don't become unhappy because suddenly stuff happens and they think at least that they never heard about it. Right? So, so that relationship with the consumer is important as well. Let's look at the third design constraint that goes into designing your API and that's the security and the threat model. So when you look at private APIs, you can say that both consumers and providers are kind of on the same team. So you don't expect consumers to act in a, in a bad way. Still can things go wrong, but um, it's not really something that you are expecting, so to speak. So it's a different kind of threat level, so to speak. It, for partner APIs, it's already a little different. So you all, you probably also have some kind of relationship, again, maybe contractual. So you still expect partners to be cooperating, but maybe they just have a little less interest to be extremely cooperating, right? And for public APIs, you really don't know and you treat every consumer as a potential threat. That also means for security, you have a different aspect, how you may handle that for, for Private APIs, maybe you want to use single sign-on systems so that consumers using many APIs have an easy time using all of them. And for partner APIs, maybe that's too complicated, but you may have some partner processes in place that you can count on so that partners don't have to onboard to each API individually or with different mechanisms. And for public APIs, you treat each individual API completely as its self-contained thing. So security should be as simple as you can make it so that people can sign up easily and that's a process you want to make as friction-free and as uncomplicated as possible. And now let's look at the last aspect of design constraints and that is the, the landscape, the design context. So when you design an API, in particular in the private context, you probably have many other APIs. And one important aspect of designing an API then is also to think about how does that fit into my API landscape? Does it reuse concepts? Does it reuse certain, let's say, uh, design patterns that I'm using so that people who are using a bunch of my internal APIs already have an easy time understanding that new one because it's part of the landscape and they all follow similar design principles. When you look at partner APIs, it may be a little different. There, your design context is probably whatever APIs you have in this partner API landscape. So again, that if you have partners using multiple APIs, that it's easy for them to use more than one API without each API being completely different. For the 
Public APIs, you don't really have that design context to fit into. So for a public API, you can really focus on designing the API specifically for that one use case to make it as good as you can possibly make it because you really want that API to be as attractive as possible and you don't have to take a landscape into account. So you probably have a little fewer constraints because you don't want to make it so much part of the family but you just want to make it an outstanding API that really is as good as you can possibly make it. Okay, and with that, we went through all of these four design constraints. So once again, this was just about designing APIs and we talked about how, whether you're designing a private API, a partner API or a public API, how that may affect the way you design the API. So keep that in mind. And in particular, whenever you are designing APIs, try to think about in which class it belongs. And that may give you some good inputs in terms of better framing your design process and making design decisions that lead you to the best possible API for that case. So thanks a lot for listening. If you liked the video, please give it a thumbs up and also please subscribe to my channel. I'll keep posting more stuff um, in the next couple of weeks. So thanks again and see you around. Bye.